Turn, if, if you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Luke chapter 2. Yes, as we uh, continue our systematic study, if you're visiting, this is just what we do here. We worship God, and then we just open the Bible and talk about the Bible and do a little teaching. Nothing fancy, uh, nothing very religious, nothing very formal. We're just people who come together and rally around a vision that God's given to us, and he uses us to change people's lives, and that's a beautiful thing. So this is the word. Uh, Luke chapter 2. Now, I had every intention of moving on. But, but I'm telling you, God, uh, I felt like just said, hey, somebody didn't get it last week, and I want you to take another pass at it. So here we go one more time. Luke chapter 2. No one's in a hurry around here. Verses 8 through 20. I want to entitle this, Fear Not, It's Good News. Not terrible news. Not threatening news, not condemning news, not damning news. It's good news. And here's how the passage reads from the TNIV version. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, watch, uh, keeping watch over their flocks at night, which means it was the middle of the summertime, which means uh, Christmas should be in the middle of the summer, but that's last week's sermon. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. Good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. <clears throat> born to you. Excuse me. He is the Messiah, the Lord. We're talking Yahweh here. This will be a sign to you. You're going to find him wrapped in clothes and lying in a feeding trough, which means he's in a manger. Suddenly... A great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests, which they just told us was all people. When the angels had left them and gone back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Hey, let's go check it out. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they ran off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the feeding trough. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. Hmm, she was thinking. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which, they had just, which had happened just as they had been told. Thus reads the word of God for this morning. Last week we talked about Christmas and how it's a pagan holiday, but it's okay to celebrate it anyways. But if you don't want to celebrate it, that's okay too. And we talked about uh, how this passage uh, contrasts civic religion, which every culture has, civic religion with the kingdom of God. How the, the authentic kingdom of God really undermines uh, all civic religion. And that was last week's sermon. I want to take a, 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 another pass at these passages from a slightly different angle, Pull out, pulling out a couple little nuggets. First thing I want us to see here is, that, is the response of the shepherds. Uh, the angel of the Lord shows up, and um, the glory of the Lord shines all around them, and they're terrified. They're absolutely freaked out of their minds. The word that is used here is a combination of two words, mega and phobeomai. Phobeo mine has the root phoba, phobos, and we get the word phobia from it. So it really means megaphobia, which is mega afraid. It's rightly translated terrified. This is the kind of fear that sets off your amygdala, that sends out a chemical cocktail into your body that tells you to run away right now. Run for your life. It's that whole fight or flight reflex, and when you're dealing with God, you're not going to fight. So there's a part that, uh, you that wants to run away. They, were, they had a megaphobia terrified by this. Now that's a very different kind of fear than the kind of fear we spoke of several months ago, uh, which is about reverence. That, that is the word phobos, which can sometimes simply mean, means to have a holy reverence for something. Uh, so for example, in chapter 1, verse 65, which was about six verses ago, which was about six months ago, um, uh, we, 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 we there saw, that it says the neighbors, when they'd seen what happened to Mary and Elizabeth, they, they had phobos. But the word there means is that they were in awe. They just were like, whoa. See, we need to have a holy uh, reverence for the almighty God. Um, that's an awe, to be in awe of God. And that's good. But to be terrified is not good. These shepherds were terrified, and that's why the angel said, don't be terrified. Do have awe. Here's the difference. Awe, when you're in awe of something, you want to move towards it. Even though it's overwhelming, it's magnificent, you want to move towards it. 
whereas with terror you want to run away. There has been, since the great rebellion back in ages past, when the human race first set itself at war with God, there has been ever since a uh, tendency in the human heart to be terrified by our God. And you find it throughout the Bible. And you find it right at the beginning of the rebellion in Genesis 3. Uh, the story is uh, with Adam and Eve, and uh, the devil lies to Eve and gives Eve a false picture of God where God is not trustworthy. Eve then uh, is convinced that she can't trust God to meet her needs, so she acts out on her own and eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to meet her needs, and that was an, uh, an act of rebellion. Then God shows up in the garden, and as we know, God had showed up earlier, but they used to move towards God uh, and walk with God in the cool of the day, it says in Genesis 2. But now they hid. They were terrified of God. They ran away from God. And then God shows up and says, where are you? And then he finds them, and he says, why are you hiding? And Adam says this in verse 10, I heard you in the garden, and whereas I used to love that sound and go out to meet you, I now was terrified because I was naked, and so I hid. When you're terrified, you want to run away, you want to hide. You, you move away from that which you are terrorized by. What's happened with Adam and Eve, and this has been the plague that's been on the human race ever since, is that they, they had an understanding of God's power, but they didn't completely trust his character any longer. And when you are dealing with either a person or a God who has got power over you, but whose character you don't trust, it terrifies you. They have the power to do harm to you, and you don't trust that they won't do that. And so it has been throughout uh, history, uh, we've had a tendency to understanding God's power to fear that he's going to use it against us and crush us. We're terrified, not just in holy reverence. No, this is a runaway from I want to hide from God sort of terror. I remember once uh, as a teenager, uh, a lot of you know that I was, I was raised uh, in, in a rather strict Catholic environment, and then at the age of 12, I blew that off, and my family blew apart, and I got into a lot of wild things for about five years until God got a hold of my life when I was 17. And uh, one of the wild things I got into was a lot of drugs, did a lot of drugs. And one night I was walking home uh, from a party or something, and um, uh, I was pretty stoned. And I looked up at the sky, and I saw the stars. And... Uh, the, I all of a sudden was overwhelmed by all these stars. And I thought I could see forming in these stars like a giant face, like the Wizard of Oz. And uh, yeah, that's where I was at. And it was like, whoa. Now, I didn't believe in God or anything, but all of a sudden I'm starting to think I'm seeing God up there in the sky. And I was, I was overwhelmed with terror. I wanted to run away. It occurred to me this, that, uh, and there would be a good sense in which you get the fear of God in your life. But see, th this wasn't drawing me closer to God or wanting to repent. Uh, it, 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 the thought all of a sudden occurred to me in this way, that if there is a God who has the power to create those stars, if this God is arbitrary or evil or has got a malicious streak, uh, we're helpless. We're utterly at the mercy of this God. Um, and that's why I wanted to not believe in God, because I thought he might be like that. And disbelief is a way of hiding from God. There's a part of us that can wonder if maybe this uh, God who has all this power is going to use it arbitrarily or maliciously or, or, or just use it to torture us or whatever. We're terrified by God. It's a legacy of the fall. Uh, last year, Paul Eddy. Paul Eddy's one of our overseers. He's one of my best friends. He's, uh, you know, we write books together and we go to academic conferences together. And Paul is a great guy and a godly man, but he's got a morbid streak to him. I mean, he... he Actually, he's, he's pretty profoundly sick, uh, but I love him anyways. And one night we were talking some theology, and we got talking about Islam, I think it was, and how in Islam, at least in most uh, Islamic um, uh, religion, it, there's the belief that everything's faded, everything's predestined. And something is right if Allah wills it, whether it's actually right or wrong. Allah can will whatever he wants, and by definition, it's good. Morality is defined by power. And so whatever God wills is good because God willed it, and it could be anything. And in Islam, everything's predestined. All evil's predestined. Even people going to hell is predestined. And God, it, it, it's good because God's the one who willed it. And there are some Christians who hold that view, that God just decides that uh, some are going to go to heaven and some are going to go to hell, and, and that there's nothing you can do about that. He just predestines it, and because he's God, you're supposed to say it's, he's good and beautiful for doing it, and if you don't say that, well, then maybe you're not one of the ones he predestined to uh, you know, go to heaven. And so then Paul goes, dude, 
what if that's true? I go, well, yeah, well, we've talked about a lot. You know, we know the Bible verses. God revealed in Jesus Christ is not like that. And, and, and then Paul goes, yeah, yeah, but see, see, if they're right, then you're predestined to think that. <laughs> yeah, uh, prove, prove me wrong. Maybe, maybe God just predestined you to disagree with him, so that, and that's the way he's predestined you to, to go to hell. Maybe what you think is right is wrong, and what you think is wrong is right, and maybe what you think is good is bad, and what is bad is good, and what is true is false, and what is false is actually true, and God's just getting his jollies by predestining you to be all screwed up, and then you're going to spend that way eternally. He could torture us if he wanted to, you know. <laughs> At that point, I punched him, and... <laughs> Dude, you need, you need a therapist, something serious. But see, the point is this. It's like God has that power. We are utterly at our, his mercy. In terms of our reasoning, in terms of our intuitions, we're utterly at his mercy. And if there's a malevolent streak in him, a dark streak in him, an evil streak in him, uh, well, what, what, what can we do about it? We live in a Kafkaesque, nightmarish universe. And, 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 and if, if God just kind of gets off on torturing people, boom, there we are. We didn't choose to exist. Here we are existing, and now he's going to torture us, you know, eternally. And if, you, if there's any part of you that worries about that, whether it's consciously or not. You see, your relationship with the God will be something like uh, a, a little girl uh, in a home with an abusive father. And see, a little girl in a home with an abusive father uh, will, will, will be thinking survival. What do I knew, need to do to not get hit again? And so in her mind, she'll be thinking, just tell me what to say. Tell me what, I, what, what to do. Whatever you say, I'll do it because you got the power right now, and I don't want you to use it against me. You want me to say you're a good dad? Okay, you're the best dad ever. Oh, right, right. You want to say that that's right? Oh, that's right. If you, you want me to say that, that, that this is a beautiful thing that you're doing as you're punishing the dog, I'll do that if it means I won't be punished like, like uh, a dog. And there's a lot of people who will say they have a monstrous picture of God, but because they don't want to be on the, the losing end of his, his, his wrath, uh, they'll say, oh, that's altogether beautiful, that's altogether lovely, what a great way to run the universe. Yes, you know, damn as many people to hell as you want, even though you could have saved them, uh, but, you know, but, but it's beautiful just so long as I'm not one of the damned people. And uh, uh, so we had this kind of morbid discussion like this. What you won't have in a situation like that if you have this terrorizing streak as you won't have a sense of life and a sense of love and a sense of freedom and a sense of wholeness in your relationship with God, you cannot genuinely, passionately love that which terrifies you. You can genuinely love that which you stand in awe of and you reverence. Yes, indeed, but, but to have a, this idea, if you don't trust God's character, it's going to pollute aspects of your relationship with God. It cannot be otherwise. And since the fall, we've had this tendency to have a, a polluted picture of God. And so when God shows up to these, these uh, uh, shepherds, they're terrorized. They're terrorized. The legacy of the fall gets, uh, kicks in. Uh, glory of God show, shines all around, and they didn't go, whoa, this is beautiful. This is magnificent. No, they're like, ah, run! One of them's thinking, I wish I hadn't stole that sheep this morning. Another one's thinking, I was just having a lustful thought, rat. Another one's thinking, oh, I, my prayer life has really been bad. We're all going to be burned. You know, see, there's always something to be damned with. When the glory of God shows up, if you don't trust his character, you want to hide, you want to run away. That's why the angel says, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on, I got, you guys, don't be terrorized, don't be terrorized. Yes, it's God, and God's great and holy and awesome, but I've got good news for you. Good news of great joy for you. And here's the good news. This Lord that you've been terrorized from, uh, not only can you trust his character, but let me tell you this about his character. Here's the good news. The Lord is now your Savior He's all that power, he wants to use it to save you. In fact, the Lord, the God who created all this universe that is so, can be so terrorizing to the fallen human race, you gotta know this. He has made himself and put himself in as humble a position as he could ever put himself. He's a little tiny vulnerable baby right now in a, as an outcast in a feeding trough. The, here's the good news, that God Almighty has used all of that power uh, on your behalf. God has used all that power to become a little baby. God has used all that power to now uh, serve sinners. He came not to be served, but to serve. He's going to be ministering to outcasts. He's going to be attracting prostitutes and, and tax collectors. Far from being a terrorizing God that sends 
people away. God has become this lovely, attractive Savior who's going to be uh, attracting. Religious people don't like him very much. But see, the outcasts do, and they're gravitating towards him. And God's using all that power to heal the sick, all that power to heal the blind, all that power to heal the lame, all that power to free people from demonic oppression, all that power finally to go to Calvary and free us from the devil's oppression, all that power to shed his blood, to reconcile us with the Father. God's using all that power on our behalf to bring us back to himself. As infinite as his power is, that's how infinite his love is. You can trust his character, and that is good news. That's good news. Amen. So he says, I got good news for you. I got good news for you. You don't need to be terrorized. Can you dare to believe that the good news is really good? Here's a profound theological insight. As though you'd get anything else from me, right? But here's the profound theological insight. Here's how you tell the good news from other news. Here's how you tell the true gospel, and the word gospel means good news. Here's how you tell the true gospel from false gospels. The good news is good. It really is good. See, a lot of people call it good news, and then they give you ugly news and religious news and condemning news. And, and, and they even, you know, they, they think the good news is cheap. Oh, yeah, no, no, we need, we need deeper news, which is the condemning, shaming, manipulative, religious news. But see, the good news really is good. In fact, the good news, if you're understanding it, ought to cause great joy. The good news, if we're communicating it effectively, because it is good, people still might not believe in it. But if they don't believe in it, they ought to wish it was true. Like, oh, I just can't, I don't believe it. But man, that would really be nice if that was true. You see, that's how you know you're, communica- you're communicating the good news. The, the good news is something that you, you want to move toward instead of hide from and, and be in, in terrorized by. And then the angel adds this. Look at this. He says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Now, there's some redundancy there, isn't there? Uh, he three times says, this is for you. For, for unto, I bring you good news. Well, he's really bringing it to the whole world, but he emphasizes you. It's for all people, which includes you. And unto you a Savior has been born. Yes, for all people. But the angel is intent on driving it home to these shepherds that this is good news for them. This is personal. Take this one personally. This one's for you. Now, why is the angel doing that? And here's why. I'll tell you. Because shepherds might be inclined to think that the good news is not for them. I said last week about how the word good news was used quite a bit in the ancient world. It was part of the civic religion whenever Augustus did something good. It was, they proclaimed good news with choirs throughout the empire. And when Augustus' son, when a new emperor was born, they proclaimed the good news. And when there's a new program, they proclaim the good news. And so these shepherds have heard the, the UN Galeon, which is the word for good news. They've heard this before. But see, if you're a shepherd, as I said last week, you're kind of far down on the, on the totem pole of privilege. And it happens to be in this fallen world that people who are far down on the totem pole of privilege often aren't the benefactors of good news. It's good news for everybody else, but it's not really good news for, for them. Um, and so they might be inclined to think, uh, well, yeah, okay, good news. We've heard that before. Thanks a lot. You know, but our lives uh, are you know, working 18 hours a day taking care of these stupid sheep in the, in the heat of the summer. And, and no matter what goes on with the mucky and muckers in the stratosphere of the upper class, we tend, our lives tend to go just kind of as they are. And so the good news, yes, there's good news out there, wonderful, but we're not going to be the benefactor. And that's why this angel goes out of his way to say, no, 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 no. This is for you. This is, this is for you. Yes, it's for other people, but it's for you. It's got your name on it. See, some of us here this morning, I don't doubt, have that same kind of tendency. Even as I'm proclaiming the good news a little bit earlier, there's a part of you that maybe is saying, yeah, right. Uh, I heard it before, and you may not even be conscious of it, but there's a part of you that resists it. That's for other people. Uh, you all, you have your disqualifiers. Oh, but see, I got the if and the and and the but. And uh, uh, therefore, it doesn't apply to me. Some of us, that's kind of our psyche. I've shared this probably too many times, but, but, I, but I, I've had a tendency to, to, to be like that. Like, it, it just doesn't really apply to me. I have an easier time believing it to other people than I do to myself. Uh, some of it maybe is, you know, has to do with history. You know, grandma comes home on Christmas and says, I got good news, presents for everybody, except for you because you're a bad kid. And you kind of develop the mindset like, okay, when there's good news, I'm, I'm on the outside of that. And some of us have had experiences like that. Maybe they, they proclaim it's good news, the economy is getting better, wages are going up, and you think, well, that's great, but I work minimum wage, and that's only gone up once in the last 17 years. Thanks a lot. I'm not a benefactor of good news. Hey, the housing industry is doing great. 
That's wonderful, but see, I'm homeless, so I'm not really the benefactor of that one. Good news, tax breaks. Yeah, but I'm not one of the upper 5% of the, uh, you know, the economy, so I'm not really going to benefit from that one. Hey, here's great news. They're cracking down on drugs. That is great news, but you see, I'm a drug addict, so it's not really good news for me. Uh, great news, they're cracking down on crime. That's wonderful, but you see, I got mugged a couple days ago. It's a little late for that one. See, the, it's one thing to believe that there's good news out there. It's another thing to believe that the good news is actually for you. And see, here's where the angel comes in and says, no, no, this one, get locked this in. This one is for you. It may be that you have been on the outside of every other morsel of good news that's ever come in this world, but you got to believe this one. This good news is for you. No ifs and no ands and no buts. It may be that you've, you've never been invited to a party before, but the good news is that, that Jesus Christ is inviting you to the party of all parties. It's called the kingdom of God. It may be that, that you've been an outcast on everything. Maybe you're a misfit in your own family, but, but the Lord is saying, no, you fit right into the body of Christ. You're invited in on the body of Christ. Maybe that you've never been uh, invited to be a member of any social club, but Jesus Christ, here's the good news, is inviting you, yes, you, to be a member of the body of Christ. It may be that you've been passed up on every job opportunity and passed up on every tax break and passed up on every, every other piece of good news that's ever been thrown out in this world, but God is not passing you up on this good news. You, yes, you, are invited to be part of this good news. It's good news for you. Here's what the Bible says about you. Receive this. Here's what it says. You ravish the heart of God. Dare to believe that. I didn't say that. That's the song of songs. You are the one for whom the Lord rejoices. You are the one for whom the Lord sings. You are the one over the Lord for whom the Lord claps his hands, Zephaniah 315. You, yes, you, it's got your name on it. Hear this with your name personally uh, attached to it. You are the one for whom the Lord throws a party. You were the lost sheep and you were the lost coin and now you once were lost but you are found now. You are declared righteous. You are freed from condemnation. You are holy. You are blameless. You're the temple of God. You're the member of Christ's body. You are filled with all the fullness of God. You, yes, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. You, yes, you are bought with an infinite price. You, yes, you have got unsurpassable infinite worth. You, yes, you are absolutely forgiven. You, yes, you have an eternal, infinitely rich inheritance. Hallelujah. You, yes, you are inseparable from God's love. You, yes, you will never be abandoned. Receive it. It's got your name on it. This one's personal. Ah. Praise God. It, it, you know, I, I, I was, this week I was teaching for YWAM and do a lot of teaching for YWAM these days. And I was down in Denver, and I, this has been kind of on my mind. And once in a while I get a little excited about it. You know how that goes. Because, uh, you know, to me this is such good news. Uh, not just good news in general. No, this is Greg's good news. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's, it's personal. And I was teaching this thing in this class, and a girl in the middle of the class started to cry. I said, what is it? She goes, I want to believe it. I want it so bad to believe this, but it seems too good to be true. It seems too good to be true. I go, I understand that. But see, that, that, that's one way that you know that you're actually starting to think along the right track. Because there's parts of your brain, maybe lots of parts of your brain, maybe most of your brain, maybe all the rest of your brain, that's saying, no way. You're kidding yourself. This is going to be watered-down, mishmash teaching. Come on, wh where's the exception clause? You know that it's never been like that. You know it's not like that. Something's wrong with this. And so the brain's resisting it. Well, one of the ways you know that you're really beginning to think along the, the good news, the great joy good news, the good news of great joy that is for you, one of the ways you know you're finally starting to get it, is that part of you, it feels like it's too good to be true. Because the reality is that God is more beautiful than we can ever possibly conceive and his good news is more wonderful than we can ever possibly conceive. And so if it feels too good to be true and too beautiful to be true, you gotta know that it's a whole lot better than that, but at least you're going along the right track. You see, receive it, dare to believe it. I encourage you to, even right, even right now, this is a little bit weird, but, but close your eyes. Just close your eyes and Holy Spirit, help us right here to receive this. Can you, if you can, picture Jesus Christ. And he comes to you, and, and now he, the first thing he does is he whispers your name. And then he says one of the things I just told you on the screen. Gail, this is for you. I love you. Betty, you ravish my heart. Greg, you delight my soul. John, you are the temple of God. Abe, you're part of the body of Christ. Oh, just receive it. Just receive it. 
Just receive it. And if there's any part of your brain that resists that, you just say, nope, I, I, God has more credibility to me than my own brain. And now you start to grow in it. Now see, as that happens, a third thing happens, and I want to pull one final thing out of this passage. Uh, is, as you get that, as the good news becomes good news, you move towards it. You move towards it. And the parts of your brain that are always kind of keeping God at, gay, at bay and that are polluted, you know, they start to get collapsed. You move towards it. It's, the beauty is what draws you. This is how God transforms his people. This is how holiness comes about. It's not the, the terror. It, it's God drawing us out of ourselves and, and, and into the beauty of self-sacrificial love. But it's the beauty. Uh, Paul says the love of Christ constrains us. It's the love that just draws us in. And so we need to get that good news and let it permeate every part of our being. Now, when that happens, a th- a, a, another thing happens, and it's found here in this text. It says here that when they had seen him, the Christ child, they spread the word concerning what had been told them and this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God. Glorifying means you just proclaim out loud the glory of God. You you reflect God's glory. And then praising God means you're just praising God. So they were proclaiming the glory of God, and they were praising God because of his glory. For all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Here again, Luke is emphasizing something. The repetition tells us he's emphasizing something. And what he's emphasizing is this. These folks couldn't keep their mouths shut. (laughs) As soon as they, they got the good news... They went and they saw the, the, the Christ child, and they just start telling everybody. They just start proclaiming all over the place. And then when they're going back to their, their sheep, they're still proclaiming God's goodness and praising God for it. Hallelujah. Hey, you guys, God is good. We praise you, Lord. But God is good. They're glorifying and they're praising God. They could not keep their mouths quiet. And that's what begins to happen when the good news really, really begins to get on the inside. You can't help but move towards it, and it starts to explode in your life. This is what's called evangelism. Evangelism is just spreading the evangel. Evangel comes from the word euangelion, which is good news. You spread the good news. You're a good news proclaimer. That's what it is to be an evangelist. This is what it is to do evangelism. Now, some of us have got rather jaded ideas about evangelism because we've come from backgrounds that have given us jaded ideas of, of evangelism. I come from one of those backgrounds. And so evangelism wasn't like good news to me. It was, it was condemning news. It was I, I, you know, something I had to do. I was kind of forced into it because otherwise the terrifying God was going to send me to hell. So I'd go door to door. And I'd knock on doors and I'd like, you know, try to witness to them. And it was always awkward and uncomfortable and, you know, and never did any good so far as I could see. And I had a good heart, you know, but, but I, I just was having kind of a misinformed theology. But we associate evangelism with passing all these little chick tracks that are going to tell people that, you know, God's mad at them. And, 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 or, or these awkward conversations, you know, where you just kind of out of nowhere say, hey, are you born again? You know, and uh, you, you don't want to hear about the gospel, do you? Or, you know, it's just kind of, it's a guilt release thing for some of us. But see, from a biblical perspective, it rather comes because you can't shut up about the good news getting inside of you. And and it just sort of flows out of you. It's a natural sort of a thing. A classic example, my favorite example, is in John chapter 4, where Jesus is talking to this uh, Samaritan lady, which is already shocking because Jews weren't supposed to talk to Samaritans, but Jesus, like Martin Luther King, out of love, just breaks down those, those racial walls. So he's talking to the Samaritan lady. And he's a guy talking to a woman. That's kind of outrageous. And he's a holy guy talking to a woman who's got a bad reputation. This is really outrageous. In the course of the conversation at the well in John 4, he just says, uh, he offers this lady life, water. Water that if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. She goes, oh, where, where can I get this? And the conversation goes on. And then, uh, and then Jesus lets her know that he knows everything about her. He says, you know, um, I know that you've had five husbands and you're not living with a guy who's not your husband. Which in the first century is absolutely mind-boggling, scandalously immoral. But see, Jesus only brings that up because, number one, he wants to let her know that he's the Messiah and knows everything about her. And number two... He wants her to know that the offer is still on the table. You don't have to hide from God on this one. God knows anything about you, and you know what? He loves you anyways. And the offer is still on the table. And then it says this. It says that the lady then dropped the jars that she was carrying, dropped them, and she ran to town. And she told everybody. She ran back to town, told everyone, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Now, get this. You wouldn't think that'd be good news, would, would you, given her what the things she's done? And the people in this town know this. 
And, and so they got to be thinking, that's good news? He knows everything about you? Uh, and she goes, yeah. It, could he be the Christ? And, and it, the joy pulls people towards her, pulls people towards him. So then it says the, the people uh, went out of the town to meet him. They moved towards Christ. Why? Because there was good news here. There's water on the table that is unconditional if, ands, and buts. That's good news. So the people, like, they're thinking, well, if this lady is happy about it, then I can get happy about it. So they move out to, to meet the Christ. I guarantee you that if, if this woman had had a conversation with a Pharisee, which, of course, never would happen because Pharisees would never talk to the likes of her. But if they would have had a conversation, it would not have been good news. Uh, no, it would have, and if this Pharisee knew everything about her, it would have been damning news, condemning news, shaming news. But she would not have run back to town happy, I guarantee you that. Uh, if, if she believed that this Pharisee was the Messiah, she would have ran back to town. But she would have said to f- people, run for your lives. There's somebody who knows everything about us. <laughs> this is bad news, terrifying news. And then some of the religious people would be, would be saying, okay, just tell us what we need to do so we don't get hit. You know? But see, as it was, it was a fullness of life. She, she gets the good news and she proclaims the good news and then people want that. So also, the most important thing we can do for evangelism, and we're all called to be evangelists, to spread the good news, to tell people about Jesus Christ, because God wants everybody to enter in on this good news, uh, to know about his outrageous, mind-boggling love. And he, he uses us to do it. But see, that shouldn't be this sort of awkward, ought thing. You know, some contexts, some of you have heard this question, haven't you? How many people have you won for Jesus this year? How many people have you brought to the Lord this year? And everyone's kind of like, and then some people lie. Seven. (laughs) And see, some are called to plant, and you plant with every Christ-like thing you ever do. Yeah, some are called to plant, and some are called to sow, and, and, and so don't, we, there's just no reason to get into that kind of shame stuff. But see, it ought, it, it ought to be like this. If you want to be an evangelist, and we all should, the most important thing is for you to get the good news, for you to really let it get on the inside, for you to spend time where you just let Jesus tell you what he's already told you in the Bible, but it's got your name attached to it. Let that good news get in. Begin to walk in that. Like Heather said, you speak truth, you think truth, you imagine truth. Uh, daydream about your identity in Christ and, and, and how Jesus loves you. And let that, when it becomes real in you, it begins to percolate out of you. You begin to take on the aroma of the kingdom. Uh, you know, uh, opportunities begin to open up. Two things are necessary to be an evangelist. Number one, you let the good news in on your life. And number two, walk in love. Just walk in love. If you go around loving people, blessing people, uh, you know, j- just, just living in Christ like love as he's loved you, God will find you opportunities to share the gospel. When you're excited about something, it kind of comes out of you. I sat with a guy the other day on the, air, on the airplane. And I said, hi, I'm Greg, I'm over here, we, you know, what's your name? And so we got to know each other. Within 30 seconds, he showed me his picture of his, his baby, uh, you know, his newborn baby, like six weeks old, big baby, I'm telling you, his baby had to be 12 pounds, like, oh, the, he gave birth to the Buddha. But he was so happy with his child. It's like, oh, the, and see, because it was, it was in him. Here's a total stranger. We just meet. But it's like, oh, have you seen my kid yet? I'm thinking no. You know, it's like. <laughs> but see, when, when the good news is inside of you, it's a natural thing. It's not an awkward thing or whatever. It's just a matter of, you know, someone asks, why are you so nice to me? Ah, God's good. I just, God's good, and I just like to share it. Boom, there's a little door that starts to open. Um, why do, you, why do you that kind of smile? Why are you uh, upbeat? Why, why do you, you know, whatever? And then you're able to just, naturally, it's like, can I show you a picture of my Savior? Look at this, look at it. He's, he's really great. He has just, you got to see what he's done for me, you see? And it just kind of, actually, don't carry a picture of Jesus. That'd be a little corny, all right? But I'm just giving an analogy here, an analogy. Let the good news on the inside. Let the good news on the inside permeating your brain, permeating your heart, really believing. You dare to believe that it could possibly be this good. And as you, after you do that, dare for some more. And the more you move into it, the more it transforms you, the more it percol- percolates all, uh, out of you, and you become like the Samaritan woman where you just go to the town and, and the good news in word and in deed is flowing out of you. Would you close your eyes for just one moment? Are you, anyone here this morning who maybe this is the first time you've heard the good news really preached as good news. Maybe you've heard it a million times. But whether you've done it before or you haven't done it before, you're, right now your life isn't surrendered over to him. See, this is, the, this is the one thing that needs to happen for you to be a benefactor of the good news. And it's the only thing. And that is that you, right where you are, 
surrender your life to him. That's not about a theoretical belief, and it's not about praying some magical prayer for fire insurance. It's about really, truly surrendering your heart. And if you, have, if you right now, as you're sitting there, are not in a state of surrenderedness, I would just like you to acknowledge that before God, and I want to pray for you from up here. In fact, we're going to have a prayer together. But I, would you just raise your hand? If you're here in an unsurrendered state, raise your hand just very quickly, and I want to pray for you. Over here, a couple of people. Wonderful, I see that. To my right. In the back, there's a person. In the middle here. Okay, wonderful. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. If you're in an unsurrendered state, that's not about being religious or not religious or, or anything. It's just a matter of right now, are you willing to, to the best of your ability with God's help, surrender your life over to Christ? Anybody else? Just raise your hand. In the back there. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Over to my left, there's a few people. That's good. That's wonderful. Anybody else? Okay, maybe I saw your hand, maybe I didn't. Maybe you raised your hand, maybe you didn't, but God knows your heart. And if you want to surrender your life, pray this prayer out loud with me. The Bible says, confess with your mouth. This isn't magic, it's a wedding vow. And we're all gonna recite our vows with you because this is a corporate thing. We're welcoming you into the kingdom. So if you're really ready to surrender, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that you are my Lord and my God. And I confess that I have not lived consistent with that. I am a sinner in need of your forgiveness. But I thank you, Lord, for the good news that you've given me. And I believe Jesus Christ died for my sin. And so I ask you, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Wash me, forgive me, make me whole, and help me live for you the rest of my life, starting right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. Praise God. Praise God. That's wonderful. Those of you who prayed that prayer uh, for the first time or it's a recommitment, whatever, I want to ask you to take the first step in walking with God, which would be to come up here to my right and your left as we're dismissed. There'll be a person up here who would love to explain to you uh, how to start walking with God. We have this new Alpha course I mentioned earlier, which is a marvelous way to get started in your walk with God. Uh, th this isn't just kind of a magical show or anything. This is about discipleship, really getting in on the kingdom life. And I'm telling you, the more you surrender, the more you grow, the better it gets. Go all the way with God on this. Go all the way with God. If our prayer teams would come forward here, uh, if you have any need whatsoever that you'd like to have prayed for, encourage you to come forward and get some prayer. God bless you. Go out, love on people, spread the good news, and build the kingdom. In Jesus' name, love you.